Welcome to Finding Happiness in the Midst of Adversity. My name is Alexia Georgiou. I'm a life coach, author, and speaker. I have 25 plus years in mental health and social work industries, and I recently started my own business. I furthered my education with a leadership and management certification from Wharton Education, and I began to integrate these concepts. Within the past 10 years, we have found immense progress in the field of neuroscience and psychology, specifically positive psychology. We've defined the science of happiness and what that means, and we're learning. Have you ever made excuses? Listen to that inner critic or the voice of others. Has worry taken over your thought life? or doubting yourself with imposter syndrome? Are you afraid with what's happening in the world, the instability and the change? We all have hopes and dreams, and it's important to hold on and not give up. Optimism is the muscle that we need to build to keep going, keep hope alive, and keep dreaming. Take a moment to jot down what brings you happiness. What we thought about happiness just isn't true. Historically, we thought, well, it's ideal. It's something that I'm working towards and it's uninterrupted bliss. We do have moments of bliss in our lives and it's fleeting. It doesn't last because events happen, life happens, disappointments happen. And what we're moving towards when it comes to identifying happiness is what's our environment like and how does that affect us? And we're also learning that we are responsible and there's brain exercises to train our brain and increase happiness. The 2020 happiness report talked about subjective well-being. Happiness in the United States fell since 2008. Even though we're more wealthy financially, we have not seen increased happiness. Whether we call it well-being or happiness, it can be measured, increased, sustained, and restored, even for people who have been traumatized. So the events of life do not define happiness. Uh, and they should not control our state of being. So how are we doing this research? Researchers are looking at the brain, its circuits, positive emotions with optogenics, light that's turning circuits on and off, the functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, uh, technology has really brought advances to look at brain activity. So now we have measures and maps. Basically, they can see our emotions. They can see how our emotions respond to stimuli. Researchers are hoping to find how strongly we react to stimulus, positive and negative, with the goal of shortening the negative emotional response and prolonging the positive emotional response. Have you ever known someone that they were so healthy uh, physically and they were eating right and they were exercising and then they suddenly dropped dead of a heart attack? And people say, but they were so healthy. They ran and they were watching their diet. I know they were. Did we ask ourselves about their emotional well-being and their mental self-care? Were they able to express their emotions freely and regulate them to positive? The studies show that optimism has a positive correlation with heart health. Our goal is to equalize our thinking with physical well-being and emotional well-being. We are taught from a young age how to groom and take care of our bodies, how to eat right, the importance of exercise. And yet, do we learn about our emotions, how important it is to feel and express 
and what the feelings actually are. Our goal is to train ourselves with routine brain exercises. The brain can grow and develop. This is just as important as physical exercise. There's benefits to happiness. You're gonna live longer and be more successful. There's a 14 percent higher risk of death for those who self-report they're not happy compared to those who report they are happy. Happy people have 3% greater earning potential than less happy people. Happy people have 12% more productivity than less happy people. So if you have co-workers, if you have staff, and you want them to be productive, this training and this course is the answer. Happiness is not always feeling good. Being in a state of enjoyment with uninterrupted joy, sunsets, home runs, chocolate cake, kittens, babies. Characteristics of happy people include the emo-diverse, that means they're able to manage all different emotions and are satisfied with the way life is going. Our goal really needs to be to find a contentment with life. There will be ups and downs, uh, and we will have situations surprise us. Change will be constant. We will have loss, and we will have the emotions. Being comfortable with our emotions is a valuable skill to develop. COVID-19 helped a lot of us to rethink what's the priority in life. And the question that a lot of us are asking is, will we find a renewed sense of gratitude for simple things? Or will we fall back into our old routines? And what does research show? We have to be intentional to bring something new about. And when we participate with other human beings, with these intentions and exercises, it sticks with us longer. Sustaining satisfaction with life requires practice and intention, even amid difficulties, disappointments, and loss. So we do have a complex emotional response. There are no bad emotions. When it becomes harmful is when we get stuck. Anger is rooted in sadness and fear and we need to increase our understanding. So the next time you feel mad, acknowledge it. There's probably a really good reason that you're angry and look at why, what's causing the anger and go deeper. What are you sad about and what causes you to feel fear? Because that's the root of it. We're more comfortable with saying anger, expressing anger because we feel power. Happiness is a choice. Happiness is a skill. Well-being is a choice. Well-being is a skill. Just like physical health is a choice and a skill. We have something to do about it. We make decisions every day what we eat, whether we exercise, and we need to make those equal choices with our mental health. Psychologist Mary Piper shares how she spent Christmas without her children, family, or friends due to COVID-19. She and her husband enjoyed nature during a walk. She felt very happy confirming what she believed and taught others all along about happiness. We can measure happiness. Dr. Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia has conducted decades of research in positive psychology. He says that we can increase happiness using interventions. We can measure happiness using the Satisfaction with Life Scale. Go to his website to find these self-measuring inventories, meaning you can go, you can choose one of the inventories to take, practice these skills, and then go back and take the same one over four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 
and that will help you recognize the progress. How we see ourselves is how we are going to present ourselves and how others will experience us. Visualize your best self. Virtual reality is evolving with digital interactive characters to look and act like real people to enhance emotional wellness. We want to help people navigate our inner world. Uh, so there are institutes where a lot of creativity is happening in this arena. Environmental factors do contribute to happiness. The 2020 World Happiness Report did report this. They talked about it. Uh, and so we measure happiness by how we feel and how we evaluate our lives. An app called Mappiness was used, and users reported feelings of happiness at random points during the day. They reported their time and location, and the findings were positive emotions recorded more often uh, when people were in parks or by bodies of water. And the social environment was also important. Walking with a friend raised moods by 7.5% compared with 2% when hiking alone. And you may be saying, well, that's common sense. And yes, we all plan those outings in nature to go to the beach, go to the lake, go to the mountains where there's rivers, take walks. Uh, we are social beings. The question is, how are we integrating this intentionally during our day? We're talking about work-life integration. Have you noticed that it's more difficult to separate the two, especially with technology increasing? It's very important for our well-being to integrate breaks where we take deep breaths, where we get sunshine, fresh air, because our well-being directly correlates with our productivity and engagement at work. The techniques that we have in apps currently to nurture our happiness include mindfulness and gratitude. What is mindfulness? It means being in the moment, grounded, knowing that this is what I have to work with is now. I can't change yesterday and I can't do anything about tomorrow. Uh, have you ever let your mind wander? Uh, where you're worried about something or upset about something that happened. And so mindfulness says, okay, what I have is now. What can I do about it? And I'm going to do what I can, let go of the rest, and be mindful of the moments that I have. Gratitude also, we've had multiple gratitude studies. Sean Aker, he began his research when he was at Harvard and he gave participants a gratitude journaling exercise. He scanned their brains before they started the exercise and scanned the brains again with the fMRI 23 days later. The exercise, write down three things every day, three different things that you're grateful for. The participant's brain rewired significantly from this exercise. And so that's why we're seeing mindfulness and gratitude being integrated in these apps. Neuroscientist Simon Thomas is advocating for forgiveness and apologizing to also be integrated in these apps. There's power to forgive people. And we've heard this. It's part of emotional intelligence. Uh, not forgiving only hurts ourselves. Equally, apologizing has power uh, because human connection is fostered when we can sincerely apologize. And this means that we have thought it through, take responsibility for our actions, and are specific. So how do we keep happiness in the midst of adversity? We are stressed out about being stressed out. This causes us to only focus on basic needs. Food, water, warmth, rest, security, safety. This is a commonality among all people. We're just in automatic mode. From financial crises 
to natural disasters, sudden deaths, fear of war, worldwide pandemics. And we need to meet those needs. There's an acronym called HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When we are any one of those things, or all four, we should halt and take care of our needs. Because we get cranky when we're tired or hungry. And we need to be calm. Maslow introduced the hierarchy of needs. And we cannot progress to personal relationships and community or creativity with self-actualization until we meet those basic needs. Again, food, water, warmth, rest, security, safety, physically and psychologically. How safe have we felt during COVID-19? Uh, we know that there's danger and risk of a virus. We protect ourselves with masks and we don't touch one another. We watch out for the air that we breathe because those particles, we could consume them. We have had risk to our safety physically. How has this affected us psychologically? We've been in our homes, many being isolated, and that same happiness report in 2020 prior to the pandemic reported that there's a loneliness epidemic. A research study showed one in 11 people worldwide stated they feel so alone that they cannot identify one person that they can depend on. I went to a national conference with psychologists and neuroscientists and counselors and coaches. One of the cognitive neuroscientists, Dr. Caroline Leaf, was speaking to us and she said, you know what people need more than anything is to be heard. If we would just listen to one another, we wouldn't have such a need to go to therapy. Now, in no way was she discounting the true nature of a mental illness as a disease. A lot of us experience anxiety and depression and it affects us because we don't talk about our needs and our feelings and our thoughts. When we have these basic needs met, then we can focus on relationships and community. Feeling connected to other people elevates our well-being. Now, this is the question. How are we kind of stuck in the basic part with this pandemic right now because of safety concerns? Uh, and how long will this continue to affect us? How has the world changed and how can we adjust? Pivoting during these times is so important because we just can't stay here in this survival mode. Um, our lives won't thrive. And if you're an employer or a member of a team where you depend on one another, you definitely want to get to that self-actualized creative part to innovate. And it comes in steps. So we need those basic needs continually nurtured and taken care of. Our relationships fostered so we can reach our potential, dream, bring about change and innovate. So how do we move from surviving to thriving? It's intentional. This means we blossom, we grow, we flourish, we succeed. Happiness is success. Adam Grant talks about attention management. Are you a multitasker? He has conducted research showing that the brain will relax and will be more productive if we just pay attention to one thing at a time. Prioritize the people and projects that matter. And it won't matter how long anything takes. Focusing on getting things done for the right reasons, in the right places, and at the right moments. There's stress that we can and cannot control. 
create an actionable step. So what this looks like is email. Okay, so email, do you check it all day long? Do you have the notifications on your phone? Uh, because that's very disruptive. Paying attention to one thing at a time means I'm going to check email at 9, noon, 3, 5, or 6, and then let it go until the next morning. So that's your actionable step. That's something that you can control. You can't control the amount of emails that you're getting. And so you're going to say at 9, I'm going to spend 15 minutes reading and responding to email. Now you could say at nine I read and at noon I respond, or you could say at nine I read for um, and respond at the 15 minute mark, I'm moving on even if I didn't get to all the emails. We become absorbed in the task for a certain specific amount of time. This nudges our brain to be positive and productive, reducing stress. And this helps us keep hope, and this gives power. Hope is food for our brain. Sean Aker did studies, and practicing these skills brought about results with increased productivity of 30%, 37% increase in sales, with 19% increase in accuracy on tasks. So when I go to the doctor and I'm being diagnosed, I want my doctor to be rested well and happy because I need some accuracy there. Or when my accountant is doing my taxes. Uh, also, if you're in a sales force, 37% uh, increase in sales, that's money in your pocket. And for those who want to see more productivity with your team, 30% more productive. That's the key right there. And so how are you going to foster happiness on your team? Focus on the well-being of your workforce and make that a priority. Neuroplasticity means the brain can change. In the 80s, we were taught, you just have your brain. It's how it is. Now we're taught the brain changes in response to what we do. Nutrition. Now I'm not here to tell you to eat beans and less meat, but there is research that shows people living up to 100 plus years old have a diet of beans and they're only consuming meat five times a month. Exercise is excellent for brain health. It's a matter of life to achieve optimal capacity, naturally diminishing depression and anxiety by increasing the endorphins. We need water. 80% of our brain components are made of water, um, tryptophan, raw material. And the brain needs to develop serotonin that leads to happiness. So when we don't have enough water, we're frustrated. Sunshine. This helps us sleep, waking up feeling more refreshed with better concentration and a decreased level of pain. Go outside every day. Have your vitamin D levels checked during your physical. If they're low, try getting more sunshine. Talk to your doctor about it. Some people take vitamin D supplements and have that monitored. Temperance. We need to do everything in moderation with self-restraint. This provokes better mental health performance. Almost 20% of breakups are related to alcohol abuse. And alcohol can impair our frontal lobe cortex that helps us make good decisions. And so if we are impaired, then we can have an increase in cheating behaviors. So we're making really bad decisions when we don't practice moderation. Fresh air. In the 1919 flu epidemic in Eureka, California, the army built tents. People healed outside faster than inside because of the fresh air. Rest. Critical thinking is better after a full night's sleep. Those who didn't sleep thought they performed well, 
even though they didn't. So our perception of ourselves is not accurate if you pull all-nighters. And trust, this is what we're going to focus on. Um, are you living close by a friend, someone that you love? Are you spending time with like-minded people? And by that, we mean people who ascribe to your values. So it does not mean that you agree when it comes to uh, politics or even religion or you have the same race or ethnicity or sexuality. It just means that your virtues are compatible. Humility, gratitude, courage, justice. Those of faith going to a worship service four times a month or more have a higher life expectancy of 14 years or longer. Knowing that our lives has meaning gives us seven more years of longevity. So this is why we're talking about trust. So think about all the change that has happened in your life just in 2020. What, how shocking. Was it that the whole world shut down? How angry did we feel that we were being told what to do? That there was this virus that we couldn't control and we didn't understand and remained with us. We rationalized by blaming. We said, what if? We didn't feel communicated with. And then, you know, to find peace with all of this, we need to just accept the reality and choose hope. And maybe tomorrow won't be better than today. Maybe there's going to be another disaster that's not related, something new. And I'm choosing to keep hope. So in your team, you may have this happening at different levels. Emotional contagion is just as real as a virus being contagious. So if you have a team member that's very angry and they don't regulate that to positive emotion, it will become a contagion within the whole team. So Helping this process along is key to well-being at work. Uh, to answer questions, to be as transparent as possible, um, and to help the team work through these emotions to accept reality and to foster hope. So this is team building. When a team trusts one another, they will thrive in a crisis. Individuals and poorly led teams will panic. So fostering hope and a process to talk about the stressful circumstances greatly increases the trust on the team. Dr. Martin Seligman has come up with a theory of well-being called PERMA. Go to AuthenticHappiness.com for well-being measures. Uh, that's where you find uh, measuring your well-being at work, your life satisfaction, your well-being in life, uh, and positive emotions is the first step. So we have all kinds of emotions and it's talking about them, journaling, uh, regulating the stress, walking, crying, screaming, singing, uh, and letting it out. And then saying, okay, I choose accepting it and I choose hope. That will put us to this peaceful place. Engagement. Giving full attention to one task at a time. Look for being absorbed. Take frequent breaks. Give your brain a rest. Foster your relationships. Make them a priority. Meaning. What are you doing that has meaning and purpose? 
increase those tasks and accomplishing. So we want accomplishment that is going to bring change to our world and change begins with ourselves. When we begin practicing these exercises, we're functioning better, it's splashing onto others, and having that positive effect will go a long way. Uh, the best way to create change is through social norms. We are social creatures. Uh, we watch each other for cues. If the leader is stuck in an emotion and speaking out of fear, trying to force, using positional power, then we are going to be in a state of fear and freeze and feel shame when we make mistakes and we won't feel psychologically safe at work. When a leader is collaborating, saying, yes, I'm capable, but I don't have all the answers, I need you too. Then we're gonna engage, we're gonna own it and give our input. When a leader avoids us and doesn't communicate, Oh, this is one of the worst things that we could do. We as human beings need communication. Our leaders cannot communicate enough to us. We need reassurance. We need repetitive communication. Accommodating us. We can't always be accommodated. We can't always get our way and we need to be okay with that. You know what's important is that the person feels heard and validated with empathy. Okay, I hear this is what you're saying and I hear this is what you need and how you feel about it. Boy, if a person can come to you and communicate that, they're very emotionally intelligent. Um, and stay with those needs and feelings. And even though we can't always be accommodated and things don't go our way, we regulate back to positive emotions and find a level of contentment because none of us get our way. And just the act of being heard helps us uh, and validated, okay? Uh, and change, change is hard. And just remember that any time change happens, it creates anxiety in people. So teaching a team how to regulate and stay in the positive when a lot of change is happening is really key to reducing that anxiety and stress and fear that they can feed off one another because it's gonna really lower the productivity. Dr. Martin Seligman studied all major religions and philosophical traditions and found the same six virtues were shared in virtually all cultures across three millennia. Those who live close to their faith and philosophy are courageous. They believe in fostering good for humanity with justice. Learning is a key virtue, continual learning. Humility, being able to admit when we're wrong and being connected spiritually. The VIA Character Strength Test shows us what our top strengths are and it groups the strengths in these six virtues. It's free to take. Uh, and when we apply our top strengths, to a stressful circumstance, that's what Dr. Sullivan calls flow. So we naturally apply the strengths when things are going well and we don't even think about it. But when we're anxious, applying those top five strengths will help us to just say, oh, I got this. It's all gonna be okay. I'm gonna keep hope. I'm gonna keep that grit and growth mindset meaning I'm gonna keep applying the skills building. Just like someone who goes to the gym and you start lifting weights and you start low weights and you start building up and it's not just lifting them once, 
How many repetitions do you have to do every single time you go to build your muscle? It's the same with these strengths that we have and this skill that we're building. We're literally rewiring the brain to naturally default to positive. And we are wired to naturally default to negative. And so this is a long-term process. You can go to the Via Character Strength Dot com and take this test. It's free. It's 20 minutes. I keep my five strengths in my planner so I can look at them and I can remind myself, okay, Alexia, take a break and uh, think about how you can apply your optimism right now because you're, a, you're pretty hopeless. Uh, you're devastated by what just happened. I mean, do you hear that I'm identifying emotions? It's not a criticism of my character. It's just how I feel. I think we relate how we feel to our self-worth or how we strong, strong we are as human beings. Not at all. Emotions just are. And so being with like-minded people is finding people who value the same things uh, and are humble and like to talk and grow uh, and don't have such a fixed mindset. Growing up in school in the U.S., we are taught you're good at this and you're not good at that. In China, students are taught with a growth mindset. Keep applying yourself and you will learn. In the United States, we naturally have the growth mindset when it comes to sports, and we need to begin applying it more and more to our education systems. And this is happening with positive psychology. And we need to apply this in our place of work. Okay, so our life has 10 areas that we need to focus on growing. And we need to balance it out. Right now, just jot down what percentage of time do you spend at work, or if you're working from home, or do both? How much time do you spend with your partner? And if you're single, I'm single. Uh, so how much time do you spend self-love just with yourself? How much time do you spend having fun, including vacations, but also having fun, having an outing? Uh, and I know that define outing with a shutdown and a pandemic, uh, okay. It could be doing art. It could be reading a book. How much time do you spend every day with family and friends? What about growing and learning? How much time are you spending every day with community, focused on social responsibility, being connected to what's happening in your community? What about your health and fitness, physically and your spirituality? So nobody's wheel is going to be equal like this, but this is our goal. Because these 10 areas of life growing simultaneously will help us find that work-life integration. So everything I just named, plus environment, is equal to work. And work is only one-tenth of life. So spirituality, health and fitness, community, growth and learning, money and finance, fun and recreation, family and friends, career and work, environment, partner and love. Remember environment, how much time do you spend outside, near nature, near water, taking a walk with someone, 
Because remember, that study showed there's an increase in happiness. Now the next thing to do with each one of these is to identify, okay, I don't spend much time on growth and learning and I would like to spend more time. I don't really have fun. And I would like to begin doing art. And maybe you've been told all your life you're not artistic. And I'm here to say, yes, you are. You are an artist of your own life. You are here to create. That's your self-actualizing place. Write. And whether it's a blog, a journal, just writing what's in your mind and in your heart, it, just because you weren't the best academic writer and you're not a journalist does not mean you're not a writer. Write. Spend time with family and friends, you may say, ah, not really, and I would like to increase it more. So what are you going to do differently every day, every week, to increase these areas? You may say work was about half or three-fourths. And so how can you rein that in? And who can help you do that? Now you may say, oh, well, uh, I wouldn't have to work as much and I wouldn't make as much money if I did what I loved and I really don't love what I do and I'm not really happy, but I do it because I have the money and I have the things that I have. I mean, that's just working with your own values. Nobody can judge you. Do you want to sell everything and downsize and not need as much money to live. Are you going to be happier if you're doing what makes you happy? It's worthwhile to consider. So write down some of those thoughts and see how you can explore it. Remember that throughout your day, taking breaks recharges your brain. And so how can you integrate that in to your day? Because if you're going to see a 30% productivity rise by focusing on your well-being and happiness, then you're not going to have to work as much and as long. And it's naturally, organically going to decrease the time that you're spending working. And so that's another strategy uh, on how to reduce the percentage of time spent at work. Our community needs us, we need to speak up, uh, it matters, and we are connected to one another and our community. As human beings, we're continually growing and learning. The moment we stop growing and learning, we die. We begin to have decline. Uh, so it's important, you know, how can I grow and learn? What can I do? There's lots of resources. There's so many podcasts. There's so many books. There's online classes. Uh, there's community meetups that are online right now. Uh, health and fitness, take that walk. Get outdoors. Get the fresh air and the sunshine. Drink the water. Be with people who uplift you. And this is a plan in progress. So what I suggest that you do is write all this down and begin working on it in small steps. Uh, so, I mean, and it could be just once a week, I'm going to listen to this podcast for my growth and learning. I mean, you can't do that every day. Uh, and once a week, I am going to... Um, I'm going to go on a date with my partner or a date with myself and I'm going to do something out of the norm with them to spend quality time. Every day we should be having fun. That's hard for me to say once a week. What can you do even for 15 minutes? Something that makes you laugh. Something that gets you giddy every day. If you have a pet, play with your pet. You know, every day play with your kids. That's their language. That's how they connect. 
Uh, if you're not playing with them and you expect them to talk to you and trust you and relate to you and your level, that's where we miss it a lot of times. Kids, their language is play. And we need to keep that as we grow, to keep that play and fun nature. It's putting our brain at positive. And it's actually an emotionally intelligent activity. So all of this, assess it in a month and go through your percentage and fill out a new wheel and see how it's balancing out and assess it. You may want to have a partner look at it with you uh, just for some feedback, someone who's in your life that's observing the changes in your life. You may not know how. You may need ideas. We can't do it alone. Uh, rugged individualism is what I grew up being taught, and leadership used to be taught that the leader is on their own. They're a one-person show. And now we're learning, nope, we need the team, even leadership. So get other people's input for ideas uh, and for encouragement for yourself. Keep doing this monthly and assessing your growth. It needs to be intentionally done because if we just leave it here, nothing's going to change. So this will number, it's from positivepsychology.com. And if you made it to where you say, okay, um, my social intelligence is a four and I want to increase my social intelligence, to an eight and I'm going to do it by and you can talk about uh, joining a group uh, or a class where you are talking about emotions and listening to one another and you're doing that intentionally. Listening is something uh, people are writing books about the listening aspect. Uh, so Think Again by Adam Grant. The Listening Path by Julia Cameron. Uh, these are recommendations to increase social intelligence. So read a book. And so that is your goal and you're moving towards that. When we're positive, our brains become more engaged, creative, motivated, energetic, resilient, and productive. This discovery has been repeatedly supported by research in psychology and neuroscience, management studies, and the bottom lines of organizations around the world. Sean Aker, The Happiness Advantage. I do recommend that you read this book. Richard Wiseman is a psychologist who conducted a study called The Luck Factor. He brought in participants and put them in two groups. Group one perceived themselves as lucky. Group two perceived themselves as unlucky. He told them, look through this paper and count the number of images. Well, in the paper, a few lines down in large print, he wrote, stop counting. There are 43 images. As the writing went along, there was another statement. Stop counting. Tell the experimenter you've seen this and win $250. The lucky people were able to see the first line where it says stop counting, there are 43 images, and it just took them seconds. The unlucky people didn't see the writing. They were so focused on the images, the average was two minutes to count the photograph. What did the lucky group have in common? Now, these are people who had skills to create and notice their surroundings, listen to their intuition. They had positive expectations in life with a resilient attitude. So it's not that they're lucky. It's that they're skilled in these areas. And those who perceive themselves as unlucky, it's not that they're unlucky. They were anxious and tense 
And that's what got in the way of them noticing the opportunity that's all around them. So this is what increasing our brain to positive, working on our well-being, making happiness a priority as a choice and skill will help us notice the unexpected and create chance opportunities. Individuals who watched just three minutes of negative news in the morning had a whopping 27% greater likelihood of reporting their day as unhappy six to eight hours later compared to the positive condition. Uh, this was a study by Sean Aker and Michelle Galen. Uh, and so do you start your day with the morning shows listening to the news? I'm really working on not doing this and I'm uh, putting scheduled times on when to watch the news, whether I'm watching it or whether I'm reading it on the internet uh, and not focusing my time when I'm talking to family and friends on focusing on the news. Because when we do, we become upset, of course. I mean, there's so much happening in the world. Uh, so intentionally, I focus on talking about what's going well. Uh, now, we do talk about what is happening because it's so relevant and so much is constantly changing. And I do notice a, a level of anxiety, anger, sadness that is experienced. And so uh, when you do talk about these things, just be ready to practice some coping skills to regulate that stress uh, to go back to a positive state. Socially connected people are happy. There's increased longevity. This is the result of the 80 year study on happiness uh, conducted by Harvard. They took a group of students from Harvard in 1930 and a group of men from the lower socioeconomic areas of Boston and studied them. Uh, and they followed their lives. And this is what they found. They spoke to their partners. They studied their physical health. Uh, focus on quality relationships is what they said. Living in conflict is not good for us. Warm, close relationships buffer us from getting old. Isolation is correlated with declining brain functioning and shorter lives. Happy people know when to let go. Write down something on a piece of paper that you can't control, that keeps coming to your mind, and say, I let it go and tear it up. When it comes back to your mind, because it will, practice this again. Just that visual of writing it down and tearing it up will tell your brain what to do with that thinking. Dependable partners positively correlate with sharper, longer lasting memory. Arguments are okay as long as we know that we can depend on that person when the going gets tough. Replace screen time with people time. Reach out to family you have not spoken to. Liven up a still relationship with new activities. Take walks together, join a support group, practice gratitude. Realistically assess what we can and can't control. Don't let it ruin your day. Do what you can and move forward. Sleep on it to change perspective. Okay, there are daily well-being assignments. Gratitude. Proven in studies, your brain will rewire with consistent application. Have your gratitude journal. Write a letter of gratitude to someone. Send them an email. When you can, show up at their doorstep and read the letter. 93% of those polled agreed that grateful bosses were more likely to be successful. And only 18% thought that grateful bosses would be seen as weak. The Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley. Dr. Seligman has participants take a well-being measurement 
before the study. Then he gives them the assignment. Think on what went well right before bedtime. So we go throughout the day and we have responsibilities and we have problems and we're talking about them. When it's time for bed, intentionally say, I'm not going to think or talk about that anymore. Put up your electronics and journal three things that went well that day. Your brain will think on it all night. Participants subjectively through these inventories report an increase in well-being. They also wake up feeling refreshed when consistently applied. Our takeaway, a positive outlook makes our brains perform better. Achieving a positive mindset is fostered by happiness and this comes about with strong connections. This is common sense and revolutionary. And we all need to be intentional about it for our mental and physical health. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear the results that you have from taking this course. So drop a review, email me. Uh, we could chat for 15 minutes, have a coffee chat. Um, I'm also available for complimentary consultations and check out my newsletter on Substack. I thank you for taking the course and for focusing on your well-being and happiness.